tell me about the structure of the film, uh, your inspiration for making it, and um, how this relates to the other two films you've done and in your sort of journey okay. of filmmaking. We like to say that A Thin Wall is not just a documentary about the partition of India, but it's also very much a documentary about memory and about the possibility of reconciliation. And so it's certainly not a sweeping, straightforward, historical account of how India was divided in 1947. Mm -hmm. um, it's told in two voices, my voice and the voice of my co-producer, Surbi Divan. Um, she was born in India, I was born in Pakistan. And even though we were born in countries which were completely separate at that time and independent, we still, when we met, we immediately connected on account of the partition legacy mm -hmm. because both of our families were affected by partition and so we kind of grew up with that legacy. Um, so I guess that's the, um, the, the inspiration for the film. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as the structure and some of the artistic elements, I from, a, from very early on I made the decision that I would not use any archival footage in mm -hmm. the film or any black and white photographs. Uh, which are ubiquitous, you see them everywhere. And um, the reason I didn't want to do that was because I wanted to create this bygone era in very fresh and vivid colors. And so we used animation, we used art, we used literary writing. Um, and we all of these elements kind of uh, formed the artistic basis of the film. And um, the reason that I wanted it to be so vivid and so fresh was because I think that partition is very relevant even today. Um, it's a very important seminal historical event and I think we can learn so much from it. Uh, my friend Linda Moroni saw a rough cut of the film and something, and the way that she described it was something that really resonated with me. So she said that the film is akin to a book of essays, mm. which is told in a lot of different voices, some poetic, some political, some personal, but then all of these voices are woven together to convey a universal aching. Mm. And I really, really like that description because not only does it explicate the structure of the film, but it also talks about the ultimate message of the film, which is this universality, you know, mm -hmm. these stories which are, like I said, uh, which represent and undergird our, our common humanity. Why is this relevant today? And like, you know, um, I know you're screening in Rochester, like, what, 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 what is your intended audience for this film? So the reason that partition is so relevant even today is because if you look at the 20th century, that's when a lot of these very powerful colonial empires began to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. And uh, random lines were uh, drawn across maps all over the world. And all of these new nation states came into being. Um, and many times the basis for building nation states was some kind of nationalism, which was rooted in some kind of homogeneity, mm -hmm. uh, because homogeneity was really the raison d'être for a nation state. It was the very justification for their creation mm -hmm. and their existence. So um, part, the partition of India is a very, very important and very violent template for understanding questions uh, related to empire, colonialism, nationalism, um, ethnic cleansing, displacement, the creation of refugees. Um, and, and, and you will agree with me that all of these questions are still extremely relevant mm -hmm. in today's world. Yeah. So partition is just a very important template, I think, to understand all of that. Yeah. And I think the study of uh, partition is, is very important because of things that we're seeing right now in the world, which are much more contemporary. So for example, the reunification of Germany or the breakup of the former Yugoslavia or intercommunal violence in Indian cities in the 1980s and 1990s mm -hmm. or the treatment of religious minorities in both India and Pakistan mm -hmm. or the partitioning of Iraq which is a perennial project and proposal that comes up over and over again. Mm -hmm. I believe it was even passed as a non-binding resolution in the U.S. Senate in 2007. So, you know, all of these things, we're, we're, once again, we're talking about partitioning. We're talking about dividing, separating, fencing off, mm -hmm. 
um, blockading rather than dealing with struggles for economic and political justice mm -hmm. and and equity so we, because we do not want to deal with those struggles and with those movements we prefer to just divide separate and um, and you know blockade fence in mm -hmm. wall off mm -hmm. and I, I just think that that's that's not a solution at all and you can see that in India and Pakistan that that, that is not a solution that works it's affected India and Pakistan in obviously extremely uh, powerful ways so um, Sometimes I feel that, and that's one of the reasons that we wanted to make the film, was first of all to preserve some of these very important personal narratives, mm -hmm. which form an important part of our history and an important part of our identity. But mm -hmm. it was also because of the continu continuing uh, hostility between India and Pakistan. And mm -hmm. uh, Surbi and I almost felt like um, these countries have not been able to move beyond the trauma of partition. And, um, and we also feel, feel very strongly, I mean, we, we have this distrust of nationalism because we feel, especially in the case of India, that it was a, a very Western concept that was imposed on the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can see the same thing actually in other places in the world as well. So for example, if you look at Africa, mm -hmm. um, you see again the same kinds of arbitrary random borders that were drawn and that were not so much rooted in any kind of indigenous logic, but were really rooted in colonial history. And so you see all these disputes and all these secessionist movements <coughs> and um, these, um, the, the, these conflicts across the continent of Africa, which are on account of these very you know, arbitrary borders that were drawn by colonial powers. Um, and so the same thing happens in India and Pakistan, where we feel that, uh, Surbi and I both feel that we have not been able to, in a way, break away from colonialism, uh, that we still live with that, and that we're still subservient to the divide and rule policy that the colonial powers used. And so we, we, we explore and we expose all of these problematic dynamics in the film. And, you know, the idea is to be able to move beyond that. Do, do you view your film as um, a piece of a decolonization project between Pakistan and India? And what does decolonization for you look like with those two independent states as they are now that were defined by this violent history of colonialism? So yes, it, it is, I think, very much part of the process of decolonization. Mm -hmm. um, and like I, you know, like I said before the partition of India was very was a result of and very deeply embedded in colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, uh, the first census that ever happened in India happened like in the 1800s, um, and it was done by the British colonizers, and that was the first time that people had to check off a box where they had to uh, decide whether they were a Hindu, a Muslim, a Christian, or you know some other religion. This was the first time that people saw them themselves in that way. Um, in, in India, you know, tribes and families and even the province that you belong to were affiliations which were much stronger than uh, being, um, than following any particular religion. So this was really the first time that that happened. And Indians, I think, began to kind of question their own, the diversity of their own thoughts. Mm. Uh, and began to ask themselves, you know, which particular box they belonged in. So this was very much done by the British colonizers. And I think that was kind of the, the, the beginning of what ended with, with partition. Mm -hmm. And which continues to this day, because what's interesting is that the partition of India in a way was supposed to take care of the minority problem. Um, you know, the, the Muslim minorities in India felt that after the British uh, uh, after they leave, um, they, they, they were not going to be enough protections for them and that they would be stuck in this country which was Hindu majority and that their, their rights would not be protected. And so the solution to that issue was just separation, was mm -hmm. the drawing of this arbitrary line. So it was supposed to take care of the problem of minorities. But in fact, if you look at India and Pakistan now and the treatment of minorities in both countries, mm -hmm. you know, it's worse than ever. So it just re-articulated that issue 
vis-a-vis -vis two nation states mm -hmm. rather than you know the Indian subcontinent. So it didn't really take care of any problem. In fact, I think it exacerbated that problem. Like, what was that like at the border? Yeah. You know, trying to do those shots, and then also like, what what is your? Do you have any comment about just governmental secrecy and how far we've come from 1947 to now? And is there like? A chance or uh, the possibility of somehow deconstructing all of these walls and barriers that people have built up to prevent themselves from actually identifying with the other. So um, just going back to decolonization and how we can take that process mm -hmm. forward, um, I think that it's important for Pakistanis and Indians to realize um, how their relationship, the relationship between the two countries is still very much subservient to the, you know, divide and rule policy mm -hmm. of the colonizers. Um, and so rather than be able to work together to redress very serious issues of poverty and injustice and uh, just work on uh, making the lives of the people who live there better, both countries are just constantly involved in these perennial wars mm -hmm. and you know that consumes most of their GDPs and that's especially true of Pakistan which is a sm much smaller country mm -hmm. as compared to India and so you know what we're, we're trying to say is that we should think of South Asia in ways which make sense for South Asians and um, rather than being uh, hostile towards each other and being involved in these constant uh, wars mm -hmm. Uh, which, interestingly enough, you know, where do, do they get their weapons and where do they get their um, military assets from? They buy them from their old and their uh, new colonial masters, mm -hmm. right? So rather than kind of continuing with that legacy, we need to really stop and we need to see ourselves as South Asians mm -hmm. and we need to find... The, the film doesn't really give you a laundry list of political right. solutions right. and, um, you know, it doesn't give you really action items that you can kind of go through. Because uh, I, I don't know what the solution is, but we just want to expose some of these dynamics, which I think as Indians and Pakistanis, we don't really think about all of that. You know, the, um, someone says in the film, the, this Indian filmmaker Ajay Bhardwaj talks about how uh, the tradition has been in both India and Pakistan to just blame the other country for what happened in 1947. So, you know, the in Indians... Uh, feel persecuted by the Muslims mm. and uh, the, the Muslims in Pakistan, you know, will blame everything on the Hindus, you know, in India. But it's really time for us to come to terms with the fact that violence happened on both sides. And so we should be much more concerned with the violence that happened on our side that was, you know, that was carried out by our own communities. Mm -hmm. And how do we come to terms with that? How do we understand that? And how do we reconcile? Um, and I, I don't really think in terms of, you know, the border going away and India and Pakistan becoming one country again yeah. or one territory, you know. But I, I think that maybe something like um, the European Union or ideally what the European Union was, mm -hmm. was meant to do. I mean, it hasn't really panned out even for European countries. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some kind of arrangement where, for example, travel and trade and employment in the other country and just moving across the border could be easier. Mm -hmm. Whenever people travel across the border and go to the other side, they always come back with these wonderful, warm stories of how they were welcomed by the people on the other side and mm -hmm. how those people are just like them, you know. But, and I think that's why there's, there must be a reason why travel is so difficult. It's extremely mm -hmm. difficult to travel across the border. So initially when Surbi and I were thinking about the film, we thought that maybe at the end Surbi should come to Pakistan and I should go to India and we should shoot that. But just it, it is such a huge bureaucratic hurdle mm -hmm. that we actually kind of gave up on that because it's just so difficult for me, even as an American citizen, simply because and having an American passport, but simply because I was born in Pakistan, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for me to get a visa to go and, and visit India. And it's the same for them. How did you and Serbia meet? We actually met at RIT. Mm. It was kind of a chance meeting. Um, I was working on my film, my first film, uh, The Muslims I Know mm. at that time. Um, and so I had taken a class at RIT. I had taken a documentary workshop uh, during which I had edited the whole film. And so I was screening the film in front of 
the RIT faculty the in their film school mm -hmm. and I was approached by Surbi and you know she said I'm from India I said I'm from Pakistan and immediately we started talking about partition mm -hmm. because it's it's this connection that we have you know that goes across the border yeah and and I think like you said like the humanity of it is like really eye-opening it's yes. striking the personal stories, the memories. Well, um, well, actually, thank you for saying that because, like I said, you know, we don't really give you a list of political solutions right. in the film, but we do. We are very much interested in, and we do explore people's memories and people's stories yeah. because we feel that the stories perhaps are important in and in and of themselves mm -hmm. because that's where our common humanity lies, mm -hmm. and perhaps you know that's where the road to salvation is. Is our common humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I was wondering, like, when you started hearing, like, when did you encounter your mother first telling stories about partition? And I know you talked a little bit about growing up in Pakistan, and um, I'm just wondering, like, what was your reaction? Like, did like were those stories told to, told to you throughout your like your childhood and adult life or yes. were they things that you just sort of heard your mother start talking about one day and I'm like whoa what's that? <laughs> <laughs> no I uh, those are just kind of stories that I grew up with so I had you know like mm -hmm. the fact that she was on this train where there were blood stains and mm -hmm. um, because the people who had been who had traveled on that train and gone to Pakistan before them had been stopped and everyone on board mm -hmm. had been killed and this was a very common narrative on both sides of the border mm -hmm. again um, so so these are just stories that I kind of grew up with I, I grew up with this um, with this idea of the brutality of partition and mm -hmm. you know people just turning on each other but then also these wonderful stories of people helping uh, someone escape or mm -hmm. giving them refuge in their in their home there's there's so many Almost every story of partition has that as well, has that component. Mm -hmm. um, and so does my mother's story because um, my mother's family was a Muslim family, but um, my grandfather was a lawyer. And so the neighborhood that he lived in was, uh, was basically a Hindu neighborhood uh, because most of those people were lawyers and they happened mm -hmm. to be Hindu. So, you know, he was, he was living in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And um, when partition happened, um, the way that my mother's family kind of got, got out of Gurgaon and then was able to take a train and cross the border into Pakistan, that whole process was facilitated by their neighbors mm -hmm. and my grandfather's colleagues, who were all Hindus, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're the ones who helped them out. And that's true for almost any story of partition that you hear. I mean, I always think of partition as kind of being an aberration, you know, what mm. happened at partition mm. is kind of an aberration because people had never been forced to separate like that in the whole history of India. And India has always, the Indian subcontinent had always been an extremely multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. Mm -hmm. And so people were just used to kind of living with each other. And I'm not saying that there was never any conflict or there were never any issues. You know, like you mentioned, some one of the interviewees does talk about the fact that there were separate Muslim water and separate mm -hmm. Hindu water. So there were some structural problems mm -hmm. for sure. But somehow people were able to coexist. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was when you separate a society like that and you're, you force it, you kind of tear it apart, mm -hmm. then it's obviously an extremely violent process. Do you, are there movements um, afoot in both countries trying to like repair those? those that that divide that terror yes definitely i mean it's that's always been there um and sometimes they get more support from the state than at other times it mm -hmm. really depends on what's going on between the two governments mm -hmm. but uh individual citizens have always been interested in in approaching each other mm -hmm. and in you know just opening up the border making it um more open mm -hmm. and more flexible so that they can be more cultural exchange more business exchange uh, and, and just more collaboration between people on both sides and also so that people can actually visit their families because many people mm -hmm. were separated by their families and it's very difficult for them uh, to go across the border mm -hmm. and meet their relatives so it would be really nice if you know we could make that that process a little bit easier do you believe that both states are so invested in the partition that they are blind to what you just said, like everyday people 
who just want to have porous interactions with each other, like through the border to have interactions with each other. Do you think that they have such an investment in that, 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 that they will do everything in their power to maintain that... That separation. Well, yeah, that, like, that separation. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that that's... I mean, some of it is obviously rooted in the trauma of partition, which, mm -hmm. which was... I mean, it was a very large-scale event. Yeah. You know, um, a million people were killed in a few months, and some say up to 20 million people were displaced. So mm -hmm. it was huge. Just the scale of it was huge. Mm -hmm. And so many people were affected by that. So there's definitely that trauma. But I also think that the elite in both countries benefit from the separation as mm -hmm. well. And they benefit from constant war, um, especially in Pakistan. I mean, the Pakistani army is so deeply entrenched um, in everything that happens in Pakistan, you know, economically, mm -hmm. um, in terms of real estate, in terms of... Uh, um, education, academia, I mean, any and every facet of human life, of social life that you can think of, the Pakistani army is right there. So, I mean, what would happen if the, if the border was open and everything was all fine and dandy and people could just travel across the border and there was no hostility and no wars? What would happen to the Pakistani army? And in, in the same way, you know, the, the Indian elite are also obviously extremely invested in that. <laughs> so revolution is what we're talking about. Here. <laughs> um, I I um I was reflecting on your other films here. You have two other films, correct? Yes. Um, the Muslims I know, which I've seen before, and then I think I saw maybe a trailer or a rough cut of Pakistan One Hundred and One. Yes. And in all of your films, it seems like you're always trying to be. Well, you're first of all trying to allow other people to speak the stories. That directly affect them, and you're yes. trying to give platform to people that yeah. um, wouldn't normally be given a platform, yes. or wouldn't normally have that access to a media or a documentary or something. And I'm wondering, in the sort of chronology of your work, can you talk a little bit about that progression in your filmmaking and your subject matter? And it seems like you're you have maintained that um, that interest in giving people a, a, a space to, to speak their own stories. Yes. In this film, it seems far more about centered on like individuals you know, family members, that very specific kind of story. Uh, my first film, The Muslims I Know, came out in 2008. And I always tell people that I became a filmmaker in order to make that film. So that mm -hmm. was a really important film for me. And the reason was that after 9-11, I just felt that the way that Islam and Muslims were portrayed in mainstream media mm -hmm. was so distorted and so deceitful in mm -hmm. a way, you know, so dishonest that I really felt like someone had to show people something else. Uh, something that I was much more familiar with because I'm a Muslim and you know, so most a lot of the people I know are Muslims and None of them were like the people that I was seeing on TV So, you know, I just felt like and it was very the, the interesting thing was that it was very difficult to break into that discourse mm -hmm. Which was about us, but yet nobody wanted to hear from us mm -hmm. So it was a very frustrating situation and so I made that film in it came out in 2008 my, my second film was called Pakistan One on One and that came out in 2011. And the reason that I made that film was that I was actually, I was visiting Pakistan and I was shooting the, this, the partition film. And so I had set up all these interviews that I, and I was going to talk to all these people. And during that visit, the, I just realized how the media in Pakistan had changed so much. I uh, grew up in Pakistan in the 1980s when it was Pakistan was under a military dictatorship. And so information was very controlled and very closely monitored. There was only one state owned television. And most of the time it was just spouting government propaganda. So nobody used to watch television, in, in fact. But now when I went back in 2009, I think it was that I went back, everything was so so different. The media were, they, there was just so many choices and, and uh, so many newspapers, so many uh, TV shows and TV channels. And everywhere, um, every TV, TV channel that I went to, there was some kind of political debate going on. So it was also extremely political, which I found to be very interesting. Like all the Pakistanis that I met were like these political junkies who were really into politics, which was so different from the United mm -hmm. States. So I wanted to, I thought that that was something very interesting 
and something very in, uh, unexpected in a way. And so I wanted to share that with American audiences. And so even though I had gone there to shoot the partition film, I shot a second film uh, during the five days that I was in Pakistan. And, um, and that was Pakistan one-on-one. -on -one. But again, both films are really, um, I think, motivated by the need to have dialogue between mm -hmm. people who would usually not talk to each other. So in The Muslims I Know, you have American Muslims uh, addressing questions that were posed by mm -hmm. non-Muslim Americans so that you know, they can have this kind of dialogue without any, um, um, this, this kind of direct dialogue between them. And the same thing with Pakistan one-on-one, -on -one. I felt that Pakistan was like so exoticized in American media mm -hmm. that I wanted American audiences to be able to just meet people on the streets of Lahore and you know realize how human they are and funny and, and, and extremely intelligent and actually knowledgeable about world affairs. So I wanted to be able to share that with American audiences. And then with this film, with uh, A Thin Wall, Again, I think it's important for Indians and Pakistanis, again, people across a divide, people across mm -hmm. a border, to be able to talk to each other. And then to, to realize that even the stories of partitions, uh, of the stories of partition are so similar. Like, um, and I do this on purpose in the film, is that you, you get a lower third in some parts of the interviews where you kind of know where this person is situated, but after a while, I think it all starts to mix together and you forget whether this person is Indian or Pakistani because the stories that they're telling mm -hmm. and the feelings that they're expressing are so similar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I always want to do with my films is just to highlight this common humanity, you know, that we all have, the, the stories that we all tell, the things that we all feel, the dreams that we all have, the need for home, for example. Uh, the whole idea of home and, and what is home and is it something imagined, is it something real? All of these questions are very human. Um, and so I always want to highlight that in my films. Are you looking to show this film um, in Pakistan or India or is there... Yeah, definitely. We, I mean, the, the film is not just meant for Pakistan and India because like I said, I, I feel that uh, the study of the studying the partition is very mm -hmm. important for everyone because we can learn so much from that. Um, but it's I definitely want to and, and Subi as well. We both want to screen it in India and Pakistan because obviously for for people in the subcontinent, it has a completely different resonance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that that's very intimate and mm -hmm. that they've lived through. Um, that it's just part of their national experience in a way. So um, yeah, we definitely want to do that. But I also want to, to screen it everywhere else in the world because I think it speaks to a lot of what we're seeing happening in the world. Is there a bad guy? Is there somebody that intentionally wants to like, I mean, you talked about Indian elite and you talked about the Pakistani military and they both have sort of vested interests in maintaining this partition because it definitely benefits them, but not vastly, I'm guessing, the majority of people. No, definitely not. When people tell me, like, oh, we just need to be friends with everyone, that to me completely dilutes the fact that there's a problem, and the problem is systemic, Yeah. but it is also directly accountable to individuals who continue to operate within that, that system and utilize that system for their own personal benefit. Right. So, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, what you think about that? Like, is, is there, like, a, a quote-unquote enemy? Is there, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's such a, I don't know. That's just my own pride failing, you know. I, I want to think about enemies and, you know, be angry, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. Because I feel like there's this definite propaganda to say, we're all the same, we're all equal, we're all one. Yeah. And it's a lie. Yeah, it is. And I, I think there is an enemy and I think the enemy is the system. And so, you know, this is another thing that I talk about in the film because the film is poetic, it's personal, uh, it's artistic, but mm -hmm. it's also political. Mm -hmm. Because as, as an activist, you know, I can't help it. My, my films always have some level of yeah. politics in them yeah. um, because I think it's important. So the enemy is the system. And so in, in the film, I, we, we talk about how homogenous, uh, well-integrated, and so-called stable states 
are very beneficial for capitalism you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it makes capitalism mm -hmm. work really well because it's it's siloed it's scientific it's industrial it's competent it's efficient mm -hmm. but it's not human <laughs> Because, you know, being human is something messy and something that overlaps and something which has contradictions and something which is confused. Um, so this, this you know, and, and it's interesting because uh, Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore, actually in 1917 uh, wrote uh, this critique of Western style nationalism in which he highlights the, uh, the you know, the, the contrast between the way that India has always been and the way that India sees itself mm -hmm. as being this very messy and confused, you know, mixture of many different things mm -hmm. and being able to absorb all those contradictions. And, you know, this very efficient, industrial, siloed, uh, Western style nationalism which is now being imposed on India mm -hmm. and which is not a natural thing for India so uh, so yeah there is an enemy and I think the enemy is the system the enemy is capitalism which mm -hmm. requires us to be you know categorized and siloed off and turned into something non-human mm -hmm. which doesn't really you know work very well in the long run because I think this way of thinking and this way of doing things is very short-term. It's, it's very um, uh, profit-oriented, but very short-term profit. Because mm -hmm. in the long term, I think it's suicidal. Yeah. You have to be a Hindu or you have to be a Muslim. But then, you know, in the film, I actually have um, um, a passage uh, written by Asim Rafiki, who's a photojournalist. And he did this project called The Idea of India. Mm -hmm. And he spent three years in India doing that and where he was taking photographs, but then also writing these really interesting essays about mm -hmm. the things that he was experiencing. And he talks about being in this uh, Hindu temple uh, in, in Maharashtra, in Eastern Maharashtra, I believe. And um, the saint who is buried in that, in that temple happens to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. But all the pilgrims who come uh, and worship there are in fact Hindus. And so, you know, it's, he talks about the, the very definition of the word Hindu and Muslim. What do these words even mean? Because there's so much overlap, especially in a country like India, where, you know, it's even, it's, it's who, like, what is the orthodox or pure definition of Islam or Hinduism? It's difficult to say because everything is so, messy and mixed together and so you know confused in a way tell me about your writing process and how you do that because <laughs> i'm jealous i have no That's idea really how you question. it's just i mean like i can't even like i have to like literally leave my house and go somewhere else to write sometimes and then it doesn't even happen necessarily it's like yeah am i gonna get distracted again or am i you know <laughs> like gonna actually sit down and do it and sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't like yeah can you so, talk a little about your writing process and writing sure. for the film so, um, my writing process. I work in a very organic way. And I know that I've actually met documentary filmmakers who write a script for their documentaries. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I cannot even imagine. Because unless and until I have all the material that I need and that I want, I can't even start to, mm -hmm. to write. And actually, someone told me once that documentary filmmaking is more like being a novelist or it's more like writing a book mm -hmm. than making a narrative film where you already have a script mm -hmm. and you start with the script and then you you know start to get your um, your production in order mm -hmm. so so for me yeah documentary filmmaking is definitely a very creative process it's a very organic process I'm just drawn to different things and I, I know in a very kind of abstract way the things that I want to explore and almost, you know, because I'm also an artist and most of my artwork is actually collage work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at my documentary or my film work. Uh, because I like, I, I like to juxtapose things which uh, might seem to be... Um, might seem to be diverse or even contradictory, mm -hmm. but once you juxtapose them, it just, I think it provokes thought and it creates some interesting patterns. And I do that in my artwork and I also do that in my film work. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so great. much.